first off, I want to thank you for coming to today's presentation. Um, the title is Improving Water Quality in Lake Nokomis Through Biomanipulation, a Lake Management Technique. And uh, before I get into the presentation, I also want to thank um, our consultant, uh, Steve McComas. He works for Blue Water Science. So a little background on Lake Nokomis. It's an urban lake, which is located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, Minneapolis Creek flows right past uh, Lake Nokomis. Um, the lake itself is 204 acres, and about half of the lake is in the littoral zone. It's a polymictic lake, meaning that it mixes frequently throughout this, the year. And the connection to Minneapolis Creek um, was, uh, is via weir. The Minnehaha Creek Watershed District implemented this weir in 2000 um, to prevent excess nutrients from entering into Lake Nokomis during high, water, high runoff events. Um, the weir was actually rebuilt in 2013, which is pictured here on the screen. Um, this lake is actually managed by the Minneapolis Park Recreation Board, but it resides within the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District boundaries. Um, and one more thing on the weir. This weir, um, besides preventing excess nutrients coming into the lake, it also limits fish migration as well as invasive species. So how serious is the eutrophication problem in Lake Nokomis? Well, it's a deep lake according to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's eutrophication standards. So and prior to 2000, Lake Nokomis was exceeding the eutrophication standards for a deep lake. Um, so in 2000, the Watershed District implemented some, uh, implemented some tools to reduce external loading into Lake Nokomis. Um, they installed two, three wetlands on the southwest side of the lake, installed two grit chambers on the south northeast side of the lake, uh, did street sweeping, carp removal, shoreline improvement, and then worked with the residents on education about public awareness on how they can improve Lake Nokomis. Although that was successful in reducing external loading, the water quality did not improve. So prior to, by around 2008, 2009, the Watershed District asked what can be done to reduce internal loading in Lake Nokomis. So we worked with, we contracted with Blue Water Science to come up with a project to help us reduce internal loading. And one of the ideas was biomanipulation. And biomanipulation can help reduce nutrients by just shifting one element of the food web in a lake. So what is biomanipulation? Well, by definition, it's the removal or an addition of a species, usually a predator. And it can enhance the top-down or bottom-up pathways in a food web. Uh, on the screen here is an image of a basic food web in a lake. And what we hypothesized that was happening in Lake Nokomis, there's too many fish feeding in the sediment, so too many bottom feeders feeding in the sediment, stirring up phosphorus into the water column. And there were not enough fish feeding in the water column, or enough fish feeding on the bottom fish. And then we hypothesized that Eurasian water milfoil was actually the dominant plant in the lake. So with biomanipulation, we hoped that we could shift the fish community um, to reduce the benthivore numbers and allow for, native, for the native plant community to come back. So what are our chances of success? Uh, there was 2008, uh, excuse me, the 2008 fish survey in Lake Nokomis found that we had too many bottom feeders and not enough game fish or predators. And so we actually did have room for improvement in the lake. Studies have shown that lakes that have been successful with bio through biomanipulation have had to fit within certain guidelines. Um, they had to be, the lake has to be small, small enough to be manipulated, meaning lakes that were less than 2,500 acres were successful through biomanipulation. Well, Lake Nokomis is only 204 acres. So that fits within the guideline. Immigration of other fish is minimal. And yes, with the weir and at low water, in years that the water level is low, at the inlet, 
that all, so we do have uh, immigration of fish is limited for Lake Nicomas. And the reduction of external sources of nutrient loading to the lake have had to be significant. And with the projects that we implemented in 2000, we have reduced external loading to the lake. Two other things that when you, when the biomanipulation project is planned and implemented, studies have shown that where fish removal as well as stocking of game fish had to have occurred for three years or more to be successful. So Blue Water Science, Minnehaha Creek Watershed District knew that's what we wanted to do when we implemented our plan. So the goals for, bi for the biomanipulation project, all like Nick, Lake Nokomis, are as follows. Reduce the black bullhead population, reduce the stunted bluegill population, increase the game fish population to sustain balanced fish community, increase the native aquatic plants, and improve the water quality in order to meet the state's nutrient criteria standards. So in this table are the activities planned for the project. Um, we were planning to stock channel catfish as our game fish. So they were going to actually um, prey upon the bluegill and the young black bullheads to reduce the fish that are feeding in the sediments. And that was going to happen for three years. Remove the adult black bullheads. Lake, sample the lake sediments to get an idea of where and how much, where the sediments are that are potentially releasing phosphorus into the water column. Um, conduct fish surveys, aquatic plant surveys, and of course monitor the water quality. And this was all going to take place over a three year period. But by the end of 2000, there had been no stocking of channel catfish. The Minnesota DNR, who we were working with also on this project, um, their supply of channel catfish was really low. And they wanted to save that supply, their supply for higher priority lakes. As well, and at that same time, our board of managers had some reservations about stocking channel catfish in Lake Nokomis. There are river fish, they need flowing water to reproduce, but there was a small, very small possibility that they could reproduce in the lake, and the board of managers did not want that happening. So prior to our, prior to our 2011 project year, we decided to stock walleye. Lake Nokomis has had a long history of having walleye stocked in the lake by the DNR. And actually, the DNR was planning to stock the lake again in 2011. So it seemed to be a good fit. Um, walleye are also known for preying upon bluegills and young black bullhead. So they are a good game fish for this project. So instead of starting, so instead of having a three-year project, we ended up having actually a four-year project. We extended the project to through 2013. So a walleye stocking occurred each spring. Uh, walleye yearlings measured between seven and nine inches in length. Um, we had a winter kill at our hatchery in the wind, over the winter of 2013. And so the stocking of the walleyes actually occurred in the fall instead of the spring. Um, so in this table, you can see no stocking occurred in 2010. Um, the DNR stocked over 9,000 walleye in the lake. And we paid for an additional 2,000 walleye to be stocked. So we wanted to jumpstart the process uh, since we missed a year uh, in stocking. So the black bullhead removal uh, occurred over two weeks uh, in 2010 and 2011. And we removed a total of 4,410 pounds of black bullheads, which is a lot of fish. Um, and that was about 20 pounds, 20.6 pounds per acre. And what's important to note is that we, the 2011 fish survey no, uh, found that, there, that we had diminished the black bullhead population to a very low level, that we thought it was safe not to actually continue doing stock, uh, removal. So we ended our removal in 2011, which goes against the studies, previous studies that say you want to do three or more years. We only did two. Um, so Blue Water Science, they conducted the fish surveys. They set up six tra tra trap nets, excuse me, that were Minnesota DNR regulation with a four by six, four by six foot frame and with a 50 foot lead. And those nets were set over two nights each year. Blue Water Science also conducted the vegetation surveys in the lake. 
They conducted point intercept surveys with 316 points spaced about 50 meters apart. And they followed the Minnesota DNR plant density raking, sir, uh, rating to evaluate the plants in the lake. And they also collected the sediment samples. They sampled at 20 sites in the fall of 2010. The depth of those samples was between 3 and 30 feet. And they used a modified soil auger, which was about 5 inches in diameter. And the sediments were analyzed by the Minnesota Soil, Soil Lab, or the, excuse me, the University of Minnesota Soil Lab. And they were analyzed for phosphorus release and potential for Eurasian water milfoil growth. So like I mentioned earlier, the Minneapolis Park Recreation Board actually manages the lake. They conduct the water quality monitoring twice a month throughout the open water season. They use a multi-probe sonde that measures at each meter throughout the profile of the lake from the surface all the way to the bottom. They look at water temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and conductivity. They collect water samples for um, nutrients and algal abundance, and they use a Secchi disk to measure water transparency. So now I'm going to go over the results of the study. So we hypothesized that the, the black bullheads and the bluegills were feeding in the sediments. Um, so where in the lake are those sediments that have a high potential for releasing phosphorus? And through the soil analysis, um, for the, through the sediment analysis, excuse me, uh, we found that the eastern side of the lake had the greatest potential for phosphorus release from the sediments. So our hope through this project that we'd actually clear up the water and allow the native plant community to come back. But if Eurasian water milfoil is a dominant plant, is it going to take over the entire lake and crowd out the native plants? So on the left, the left map shows predicted growth of Eurasian water milfoil from the sediments, from the sediment analysis. And the green circles indicate low density of Eurasian water milfoil, yellow, medium density, and red, high density. Um, and the actual growth of the Eurasian water milfoil in the 2010 aquatic plant survey um, is on the right map. And you can see that they're actually very similar. And so the, the sediment analysis does a really good job of predicting Eurasian water milfoil growth, except for in the right and the northwest side of the lake, there is one dense mat of Eurasian water milfoil that the sediment samples did not pick up. But this is, a, this is good to know that when, we do, when and if, if and when we do clear up the water, the native plants actually do have a chance to reestablish in the lake. And that there's only going to be several minute areas where Eurasian water milfoil will be dense. So this, is, uh, this table is the fish surveys that were conducted in Lake Nokomis. Um, uh, the, the numbers are the number of fish per trap net. And there's actually been 18 fish surveys in Lake Nokomis, but this table only focuses on the ones from 2008 to 2013. And the percent of currents for all surveys is on the far right-hand column. So I want you to focus on the numbers of the bluegills, the black bullheads, and the walleye. Um, the bluegill numbers are down by the end of 2012 as well as the black bullheads. They weren't actually even surveyed in the 2012 survey. And the walleye, their numbers actually jumped as in 2011 when we stocked them. So that's hopefully what we want to see. We want to see that. Um, they were down a little bit in 2012, most likely due to angler pressure. Um, carp are present in the lake, but they were never surveyed. So we don't think they're actually a big problem in the lake. So what I want to point out is that in June 2013 survey, we saw a slight increase in bluegills, the black bullheads, and a major dip in the walleye. Well, note that the walleyes that, we, that were to be stocked that year in 2013 hadn't occurred yet. And so that's actually a natural increase in the bluegill and black bullhead population, because our walleyes were going to actually get stocked in the fall of 2013. 
So they, had, they hadn't been stocked by the time of that survey. But it is good to note that we do have angler pressure going on in Lake Nokomis. So this graph is the, the bluegill length frequency. The total length is in inches on the x-axis, and the percent fish is on the y-axis. What I want to point out, what I want you to focus on, is that in 2008, we had a very large population of bluegills that were small in size, and most likely feeding in the sediments to find food. But by 2013, we have a much smaller population of bluegills, and they are much larger in size. So they're not suited to feed in the sediments. They're more suited to feed in the water column. And this is what we really wanted to see from our biomanipulation project. So these are the results of the aquatic plant surveys um, from 2010 to 2013. Uh, we have the plants on the right hand, excuse me, the left hand column. What I want to point out is that Eurasian water milfoil is the dominant plant in Lake Nokomis throughout, for all the surveys. Um, but we, by the end of 2013, we, we are now finding eight species of plants that we weren't finding before, as well as the plant coverage in the lake has increased from the very lowest it was was in July 2011 at 11 acres, and now it's at 22 acres. So that is, we're moving in the right direction in plant coverage and plant reestablishment. But like I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, there's 204 acres of this lake, and only 22 is dominated by plants. What is, what's limiting the plant community from coming back? Well, one factor is the bathymetry of the lake. There's a huge drop off at 15 foot depth, which is indicated in the orange outline of the 15 foot contour on the map. So aquatic plants can only grow between the 10 and 30 meters near shore. But there is 100 acres of the littoral zone. Why is only 22 being dominated by plants? Why only 22 acres, excuse me, instead of all, all 100? So the other issue is water clarity. We have not been getting consistent water clarity, clarity in the lake to allow for sunlight to penetrate through the, to the bottom and allow the native plants to, to grow. Um, so this is the annual mean Seki depth data for Lake Nokomis. Um, in 2010, we started the project. We saw an increase, a slight increase in the Seki depth. By 2011, we actually met the state standards for water clarity. But then in 2012, we had a setback. Um, we had more precipitation in 2012 than in 2011. We had an earlier ice out and warmer temperatures. So that could definitely be a factor in the reduction in water clarity. And then in 2013, we did see an increase in water clarity, almost meeting the state standard. So again, we're moving in the right direction, but it needs to be consistent for the water clarity. The water clarity needs to be consistent for the water, for the native plants to reestablish and maintain the water clarity on their own. So this is the annual mean total phosphorus results for Lake Nokomis. I didn't mention before, but the 2013 data I just received less than a week ago. So this data, the water quality data, has not been analyzed for any significance. Um, but I do want to point out again, the project started in 2010. Uh, we saw a reduction in phosphorus already. Um, and by 2011, we met the state standards. That's really good for phosphorus. But then in 2012, we had that setback, and again in 2013. So we're going to have to do a little bit more investigation of what's going on in the lake. We saw the same pattern with the annual mean chlorophyll A concentrations, which is an estimation of the algal abundance in the lake. Um, again, in 2010, we saw that reduction. And by 2011, we met the state standards, which is one of our goals for the project. We wanted it to be consistent from then on. And so seeing that setback in 2012 and 2013, a little discouraging, but we know it's going to take some time for the bio manipulation, for the shift in the food, com the fish community to actually work. So, did we meet the objectives of the study? We, did we reduce the blue, black bullhead population? Yes. Did we reduce the stunted bluegill population? Yes. Increase the game fish in the lake? Yes, but angler pressure on the walleyes is going to be a continual problem in Lake Nokomis. Um, increase the native aquatic plants? 
yes, with the number of species, and a slight increase with the number of co in the coverage uh, of aquatic plants. And then did we see a re re improvement in the water quality? Yes, in 20 by 2011, but then we had that set back in 2012. So post-project, like I mentioned, biomanipulation as a management tool takes time to work. It's, it's, you can see quick results in manipulating the fish community, but to actually see the results in the sediments and in the water quality will probably take time beyond the actual project, uh, project years, which is, important, which is why it's important to have continual monitoring as part of your project's budget and time frame. Um, we're going to continue to monitor the water quality and hopefully the fish and vegetation communities as well. Um, the watershed districts may need to reevaluate the external loading to Lake Nokomis. There may be um, some new issues with external loading. If we had that set back in 2012 with just an increase in precipitation uh, in an early ice out, something we should probably reevaluate the external loading. And then um, we also should evaluate areas to improve the fish habitat in Lake Nokomis to reduce that angler pressure on the walleye population. Just want to thank the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, the Minnesota DNR, the University of Minnesota Soil Lab, our consultants, and the lake, the neighborhood lake associations for all their help and work on this project. And with that, I'll take any questions or comments.